Chapter 1. Reading. Chelsea was a kid who had always struggled at school. She was bright and hardworking, but she couldn't seem to learn how to read. As she moved from grade to grade, teachers always referred to her as an emerging reader, but her mom knew that was just a polite way of saying illiterate. It wasn't just reading. Chelsea had trouble with writing, too. When she was younger, she'd refuse to cross the midline when writing her own name. She'd write the first three letters with her left hand, skip the L, then write the last three letters with her right. Occupational therapy helped with that, but as she got older, her writing skills remained poor. She would leave whole words out of a written sentence, and the words she did write, she usually spelled incorrectly, using the wrong letters, or using the right letters but in the wrong order, or writing letters as mere images of themselves. Her mom Janice tried everything. She and her daughter wrote in cornmeal or sand, they outlined words in different colored blocks, they used phonics, they labeled every object in the house, they spelled out loud, nothing seemed to work. By grade four, Chelsea was still struggling. Her mother could barely make out what she was trying to convey. Chelsea had an older sibling, so Janice knew this wasn't normal. The teachers also recognized that Chelsea was having trouble, and they tried to help. There was a reading recovery program at the school, plus individual teachers often gave up their lunch times to coach her. But the standard refrain was that all kids develop at their own pace. Maybe Chelsea was just going to come to reading late. The school modified her homework. If the class was doing 21 spelling words, Chelsea only had to do five. But to sit down and actually review those five spelling words was a two-hour ordeal, her mother recalls. Even after an hour of study, a simple word like love would end up getting spelled with a D. It always ended in a blowout. There was screaming, door slamming, rage. Once, Chelsea kicked a hole in the wall. The family had become used to outbursts like these. Chelsea was an aggressive kid. At home, she took her frustrations out on everyone, but especially her younger sister. At school, she got into fights with other kids, and some parents didn't want her around their daughters. She regularly threatened to set her mother on fire. She was hard to live with, says Janice. Looking back, Chelsea remembers having a lot of built-up anger. It was not being able to physically accomplish anything, she says. I like to see progress. I just felt really dumb. Janice was looking for an explanation that made sense. In whatever spare time she had, she'd surf the web. One night, at 2 a.m., she stumbled on a blog post by someone with a kid just like Chelsea, who, the blog said, had been helped by vision therapy. Janice had never heard of it. The blogger described the child before and the child after. I was reading the before and thought, this is my child. They could have just replaced the name in there and it would have been her story too. A vision therapy assessment suggested Chelsea's problems could be fixed. The idea of vision therapy intuitively made sense to the family. A device that tracked Chelsea's eyes as she read showed them how poorly her eyes were moving through the lines of text. They heard about how that could be rectified, but it wasn't cheap and it would take about nine months. This was a complete leap of faith, says Janice. I'd never heard of it, but I had this vision of her working at McDonald's for the rest of her life. Chelsea started vision therapy with me in May of her grade five year. I cautioned the family not to expect dramatic results right away, but in fact, Chelsea did show quick improvement. Her mom remembers a particular incident early in the summer when they were driving to a softball game. Chelsea did something she'd never done before. She read words out loud off a billboard. That moment, oh my goodness, recalls Janice, and it had only been one month. In the fall, Chelsea started at a new school. As always, her mother went in to give the teachers a heads up about Chelsea's various difficulties and how to set up learning assistance. But this time, the teachers didn't know what her mom was talking about. Chelsea seemed to be reading pretty much at grade level, they said, not more than half a year behind, and she was scoring well on spelling. Janice was floored. I had a kid who went all the way through elementary school as an emerging reader, she says, which means not really reading yet. Now, she was suddenly just a little behind. They hadn't even done any reading practice over the summer. It was just all vision therapy. But now Chelsea was reading things everywhere. For novel study, she had to read a chapter a day, something that was suddenly easy, All along, she'd had the ability to read. She just hadn't been able to get her eyes to do what they needed to do. It was exciting for the family to see Chelsea suddenly getting great marks. She got comments like, good work at the top of the page, and her work was posted on the classroom wall. Man, we'd never seen that before, says her mom. Chelsea remembers the day that her teacher used her earth science project as an example for the class. It was an iconic moment, she says. The fights over homework were now a thing of the past. Her mom would ask if she needed any help, and Chelsea would say she was already done. Chelsea is a perfect example of how you'll get this bad behavior around not wanting to do homework when it's really just a reflection of the tasks she's been given. She didn't have the tools to achieve them. 
In our own work here at the clinic, we make sure people acquire the visual skills along the way to be able to learn what we're teaching. They see improvements in what they're working on, and all of that leads to the end goal. That doesn't mean we see improvements in real life reading every week, but we see improvements in what we're working on, and we know these will lead us to better reading. It's like when you're driving along the highway. You don't actually see yourself approaching Vancouver, but you know with every kilometer going by that you're getting closer. Chelsea made the honor roll in grade six. Now, I would be lying if I said they didn't struggle a bit with the vision therapy homework. It can be hard. Chelsea and her family did the work together a lot of the time, and they had a goal of doing about half an hour each day. Chelsea found some of the exercises simple, but others made steam come out of her ears. Monday mornings, she'd start something new and it would be tough, but by Thursday, it would usually start to click. The worst for her, she says, was something called track letters, which involves going through a page of random, nonsensical text and circling the alphabet in order. The first A, then the first B after that, so you have to track very carefully. It's a time back exercise. She dreaded it, but by nature, she was competitive, so she was always trying to beat her former time. We also set it up so she could compete with another one of our patients who was also competitive. We'd post their scores prominently on the wall so the other could see it. Chelsea also hated an exercise we call slap tap. In this one, you have to use your body to mimic certain elements of the letters you're reading. So a lowercase b involves bringing your right foot outwards, then tapping it against your stationary left foot. An uppercase b requires both the right arm and right leg to go out and come back tapping. This exercise teaches that a circle on one side of the line is different from a circle on the other, and we use the person's own body laterality to teach that. The point is to hammer home spatial relationships. There are also mirror image letters that require tapping on the other side of the body. It's easy enough when you do it slowly, but we pace you with a metronome and it can get pretty quick and challenging. I can't tell you how rewarding it is to watch a bright kid like Chelsea get the knack of reading and writing, something she was deprived of simply because her visual system didn't work right. Chelsea is not alone. Loads of children have trouble with reading. It is estimated that up to 10% of students have an individual education plan, IEP, a school-based plan to help with special learning needs, many of which are reading related. The average kid who has an IEP for reading is two grade levels behind the norm. According to the Learning Disabilities Association of Canada, people with learning disabilities are twice as likely as non-learning disability kids to not graduate from high school. They are more likely to not find jobs. They are more likely to report distress, depression, anxiety, and even suicidal thoughts. Then there are the economic costs. Research commissioned by the LDAC found that the annual cost of education for learning disabled children is roughly double that of mainstream children. Over a lifetime, the extra cost of being reading impaired could be as much as $1.98 million per individual. If there's something we can do to alleviate these problems, shouldn't we do it? Dr. Patrick Quaid and Dr. Trefford Simpson, both associated with the University of Waterloo School of Optometry and Vision Science, were interested in pinning down how reading problems and vision problems might be associated. They measured reading problems by looking at reading speed and the way the eyes move during reading. They were especially interested in the role of binocular vision, how the eyes work together, and refractive error, how the eyes fail to bend light correctly. They studied 100 kids aged 6 to 16. Half of them had reading IEPs and half did not. The researchers did a comprehensive eye exam on all of the kids, closely examining things like depth perception, focusing ability, and how well the eyes could look in unison at objects at close range and in the distance. They asked the kids to answer a questionnaire about symptoms such as headaches, sore eyes, and losing their place while reading. Then they used an infrared eye tracking system, like the one I use, to do some recording of the kids while actively reading. They recorded reading speed, which they could compare to the grade norm, as well as a number and type of eye movements per hundred words, and then probed reading comprehension. They made a number of interesting findings. One was that the reading impaired kids had a lot of visual symptoms. Another was that they were more likely to have uncorrected farsightedness, which means that they couldn't th see things well up close without a lot of effort. But the most striking and important finding to me was that the kids who had trouble making their eyes work together, something we call virgin's facility, also read more slowly and made a lot of extra eye movements when they read. When I say a lot, I mean about eight times more than the control group. The researchers say, and I totally agree, that kids who are being considered for reading-related individual education plans should have a full visual workup. 
And that means testing not just the acuity, whether the child can see the letters on the chart clearly, but full visual system function. This is currently not done. There's one other study I wanted to mention by Dr. Mitchell Scheiman in Pennsylvania and his colleagues. It involved 47 children, all of them with vergence problems, specifically convergence insufficiency, meaning their eyes didn't work properly together when looking at something up close. The researchers randomly assigned them to one of three treatment groups. One group was told to do something called pencil push-ups. Broadly speaking, the exercise involved trying to keep a single image of a sharpened pencil tip as the child moved the pencil from arm's length in toward their nose. The second treatment group got office-based vision therapy, the kind of thing I offer. It involved one hour of vision therapy in the office, plus 15 minutes of practice at home five days of the week. A third treatment group got vision exercises that looked like vision therapy but weren't. This is called sham therapy, or placebo. All three groups had to do their practices five or six days a week for 12 weeks. Only the children who got genuine vision therapy showed improvement. In the visual therapy group, 12 of the 15 kids had clinical and statistical improvements, and eight of them were actually considered cured. In contrast, only one child in the sham vision therapy group was improved, and none of the kids in the pencil push-up group were. This is important, because lots of optometrists and ophthalmologists prescribe pencil push-ups. Maybe that's because it's simple and cheap, but what the study shows is that it's also ineffective. I'm heartened to see that just 12 weeks of therapy could help with some of the kids in the vision therapy group. Often it takes longer, and maybe with more time, all of them could have been helped. But this study is great proof of principle. I also want to point out that this study was published in the Archives of Ophthalmology, now JMAA Ophthalmology, a scientific journal read mainly by ophthalmologists, who are some of vision therapy's greatest critics. So it was exciting on many levels. In some cases, true, maybe a child's problem will not be visual, but wouldn't you want to rule it out before you invest all this time and money and extra help in tutoring? Because if it is visual, the odds are that your child will not be able to take full advantage of the assistance anyway. Why waste years in programs that a kid simply can't make use of when you could get to the root of the problem and repair it? Anna came to see me midway through her grade 11 year. She was struggling at school with reading and math. One of the first things I noticed about Anna was that there was a huge discrepancy between her school performance and her intelligence level. She was extremely bright. I couldn't help thinking what a shame it was. It was obvious she had all this potential, but she was being completely sabotaged by her visual system. She was older than a lot of the kids I work with on reading. She wasn't a kid at all anymore, but a teenager, which is the most challenging age group. And by the time she came to see me, she had some real self-esteem issues. She had seriously started to doubt her abilities. The older people get, the more they tend to see their issues as just an innate part of themselves. Unlike Chelsea, Anna also carried a formal diagnosis of learning disabled. Anna had been flagged back in grade 3 as having reading problems. She recalls having to read everything over multiple times before she could understand what it said. She said she would often flip her D's and P's around. Later in middle school, she started having trouble with math. I maintain to this day that I'm good in math, she says with a smile. I just solved the problem that I saw, which wasn't the problem that was there. Sometimes that meant the number underneath a division line would appear on the top, or that the digit in one place in a string of calculations would be moved to another place, or the numbers would just be flipped around somehow. A bunch of eye doctors all told her there was nothing wrong with her eyes, that she had 20-20 vision. So, eventually, Anna was diagnosed with dyslexia. The diagnosis made her feel hopeless. There was nothing anyone could do to help her. It feels like a life sentence when someone says you're dyslexic, she says. You have this thing and you're stuck with it. You'll have problems for the rest of your life. She remembers that for a few months she got some relief with blue tinted lenses, but that didn't work for long. She'd suffered with headaches, for instance, and at first the tinted lenses helped with those. Within a few months, though, the headaches came back and reading got hard again. That's when she came to see me. I used the eye tracking system to evaluate Anna's eyes as she read. When I played back the results for Anna's mother, she was stunned. It showed how Anna kept staggering back and forth between words, how she seemed to be looking at the last part of a wor one word and the first part of another at the same time, and maybe reading the two fragments together as one word. She rarely looked at a single word as a whole word. Anna's mom looked at her and asked, how do you read like this? To Anna, of course, this was totally normal. How could she know otherwise? Normally when people read, they move their eyes forward to fixate on something called fixations, 
and they move their eyes backward called regressions to do the same. And there are sta a standard number of times a person does this, depending on their age. For example, a grade 11 reader like Anna should make approximately 90 fixations and 16 regressions per every 100 words. Her eyes should pause on a word for a duration of no more than 0.26 seconds, which is called fixation duration. What I saw was that Anna had more than twice as many fixations as normal and twice as many regressions. Her eye movement mechanics were similar to a student in grade one. And after all that, her comprehension was also very poor. She could correctly answer true and false only 50% of the time, which was no better than guessing. Anna had binocular vision dysfunction. I knew I could help. I told her that new lenses for her glasses plus therapy could make the problem go away. Anna says this was the first time in her life that anyone had offered her a solution, and that even though she didn't believe me, she was willing to give it a shot. Our sessions are a bit like any other learning discipline. You start simple, with a few exercises, and then you build on them. Instead of increasing mobility or building muscle though, we are creating new pathways and giving the brain new strategies for vision. I remember the skeptical look on Anna's face. She even said to her vision therapist, you're gonna make me play with a ball for six months and I'm gonna learn to read after that? That's not the whole story obviously, but yeah, she did play with a ball for a little while and a beanbag for part of those six months. Anna liked the ball exercises well enough. She still has hers attached to the ceiling with a pulley system. And she tolerated tossing beanbags according to our strange instructions to move only her eyes and not her head, for instance, or only her nose and not her eyes, but she absolutely hated the heart chart. This was a sheet with a 10 by 10 grid of mostly random numbers that she and letters that she had to read out loud. The trick was that she had to read a few letters from the chart at a distance, then switch to reading the same chart at close range, picking up where she left off. The first time she tried it, she had to stop. It made her nauseous. Even today, she hates the thought of that exercise, although she finds it easy now. Anna says it was about six months in when she realized that she only had to read a book chapter twice to understand it. I told her she should only have to read it once. She tried that and was incredulous that it worked. Previously, she said, if she had read something only once, she would only have an impression of what it was about. Now she was able to retain the details. And this was with a reading speed now faster than the average adult. Math was improving too. Her teacher had noticed and asked if she had a tutor. She told her she was just doing vision therapy. It had completely changed how her eyes worked. It felt very freeing, Anna says looking back. It was like a whole new future had opened up. She'd always wished she could go into teaching, but she could barely write an essay and couldn't read anything over. She says she'd go back to proofread, but wouldn't know if she'd written something incorrectly or was just reading it wrong. So university had always seemed out of her grasp. At the six month point in vision therapy, it occurred to her for the first time that maybe she could become a teacher after all. It breaks my heart to think that Anna had to wait so long to have her visual issues resolved. It's shocking that even though we can fix these problems early in life, we almost never do. Part of that might be how hard it is for parents and educators to know what's at the root of the problem. Parents, whose smart young kids struggle with speech, unable to get their brains used to their mouths to produce comprehensible sounds, are referred to speech therapists. No one tells the parents not to bother with speech therapy because they've examined the mouth and tongue and everything looks fine. No one says that just because the equipment looks okay and it performs other functions well, eating, laughing, whatever, that the speech issues must be due to something else. No one does a psych ed test on them before they try therapy. No, we refer problem speakers to provincially funded speech therapy and help those kids speak, as we should. If only something similar happened with vision. My profession bears some of the blame. Unfortunately, most vision testing looks at general eye health, major eye turns, and acuity. That is, whether they can see clearly. And if everything checks out and they score 2020, then they pronounce them healthy. Parents are told that the problem is not their kid's eyes. That sends them on a wild goose chase to find out what it might be. Chelsea's mother said it well. I'm the one tracking this kid through time. When I say something's here, there's something here. Teachers kept saying it will come. It would just take perseverance. You know your kid better than anyone else will know your kid. As a parent, or as a person who can't read, you know it does matter. Keep pressing for answers if what you're hearing doesn't make sense. Lara is another parent like that. Observant, knowledgeable, and tenacious. Her son, Kalen, was slow to walk and later shied away from things like playgrounds and bouncy castles. 
As a little kid, he couldn't climb a ladder or slide down a slide. He couldn't kick or catch a ball or hit one with a bat. He couldn't ride a bike. And despite heroic effort, he could not learn to swim. He'd had trouble with speech early on, too. Speech therapy had helped. And in school, he struggled with reading and math. He couldn't seem to remember individual letters and their sounds. He could do fractions, but couldn't understand them when they were written on paper. Lara knew something was up. The special ed teacher in the school suggested he had ADHD, dyslexia, and maybe a processing disorder of some kind. Lara was suspicious about the ADHD pre-diagnosis. Both her husband and her older child had ADHD, and she knew what it looked like, and this wasn't it. And her own father may have been misdiagnosed with dyslexia. An occupational therapist also assessed Kalen for developmental coordination disorder and believed that he had that too. Again, Lara wasn't so sure. Kalen was in special ed three times a week, but the school said he would not be formally assessed for anything for several years unless his parents decided to fork over a few thousand dollars for a private psych ed assessment. Even if he was diagnosed, Lara knew, there wouldn't be any more funding to help him. Still, the family was considering it. It was around this time that Lara noticed an article that had been tossed into her recycling bin. It was about a girl named Helena, who'd done vision therapy with me and who'd shown dramatic improvement. Kalen had already been to see an ophthalmologist who had assured Lara that his vision was fine, which wasn't incorrect since Kalen could see clearly and had no eye health problems or eye turns, but Lara still wanted to find out more, so she brought eight-year-old Kalen in to see me. Like so many of my patients, Kalen had trouble with how his eyes worked together. They didn't really track well. He had trouble finding where things were in space. Within 35 weeks of vision therapy and some very mild lenses, Kalen's world changed. They put a lot of sweat into it. Kalen's dad, a teacher, worked him three hours a day during the summer and an hour a day during the school year. But now, going to school is a positive for him. My kid went from C- and failing to straight A's, says Lara. Kalen now swims, bikes, climbs, reads, everything. What he no longer does is sob. I saw it firsthand, says Lara, a child being cured. What I'd love to see is proper vision screening in schools, screening that addresses issues like tracking. Even better would be a vision therapy component incorporated into the regular curriculum. Like folic acid in flour or vitamin D in the milk, it would enrich everyone, but actually rescue those most at risk. For people with only mild problems, it could potentially fix them before they even knew they had them. Kids with more serious issues could be identified and give it intensive training right there in school. We do yoga, we do mindfulness, why not vision exercises? Classrooms would function better if half the kids weren't struggling to follow along. For years to come, teachers would be able to concentrate more on teaching. It seems to me this should happen in the early years, like pre-K or kindergarten or grade one. I think of it as sort of school readiness program. The program could include some vision therapy basics, which all the kids could benefit from. Kids might just think these games are fun games they get to play. When I have kids, you can be sure I'm going to make them do vision therapy from the time they are toddlers. I'm not going to call it that, of course. I'll call it ninja training or something fun. As it stands now, we try to teach kids to read before we even check that they have a visual system that can handle it. That just doesn't make sense. Studies that show that kids with these visual issues will score higher on attention deficit testing, treat the visual problems research shows, and the attention problems aren't as bad, or may even go away. We also know that about 80% of problem readers have measurable visual issues. Studies and clinical experience with people like Chelsea, Anna, and many others show that if you treat the visual problems, many of the so-called problem readers can read just fine. I'm very fortunate that the parents of my patients agree with me on this, and that they are going to bat for the idea. Lara, for instance, has been tireless in fighting to raise awareness and brainstorming ideas for funding. She's a key driver of a charity I helped found called The Visual Process, which is working hard to raise awareness about visual conditions and how they can be treated. Among other things, it advocates for schools to get involved. But to be honest, I'm a little skeptical that vision therapy will hit regular classrooms anytime soon. So far, my attempts to craft and finance a pilot project, I would volunteer my time designing it, and our charity would pay for the vision therapists who had executed inside schools, have been unsuccessful. The idea seemed to threaten some people, especially reading specialists, and a lot of red tape got in the way. It wouldn't even cost that much money compared to the amount you'd save down the line. Let's face it, the school system could easily have treated Chelsea or Anna with vision therapy for less than the cost of the reading recovery and extra support, which, by the way, did not produce results. 
One dad, Steve, who is an accountant by profession, worked it out for himself. He brought his older child in for treatment when he was 12. Steve had watched him suffer all those years and, as a parent, had suffered with him. He'd also spent a fortune in tutors, and it didn't seem to have helped. After his son had vision, finished vision therapy, he quickly calculated he could save time, money, and misery if he just brought his daughter in right away. She was just seven. She went from being a grade behind at reading or to a grade or two ahead, he says. He figured he could spend the money on tutors or he could spend it on vision therapy. You're probably going to pay less for vision therapy, minus the frustration. Change is hard, but it is needed. Way too many kids suffer through their educations, unable to read and participate fully. Vision therapy could help them. It's time we recognize that and made it available.